Directed by Douglas Sirk and starring Lucille Ball and George Sanders. Not a trio you'd expect to find in 1940s crime thrillers, because they all went on to establish themselves in other genres. Cirque would become synonymous with Technicolor soap operas of the 1950s. Lucille Ball would become the queen of TV comedy. And George Sanders, well, George Sanders was always George Sanders, the ultimate cad, no matter what kind of film he was in. In this picture, Lucy, and that's the only way I can refer to her, plays an American dancer who gets involved in Scotland Yard's manhunt for a killer who taunts police with poems about his crimes. Our heroine allows the cops to use her as bait since she fits the profile of the victims. I hope I don't shoot myself. You won't. You're on the force now. Yes, sir. The film is very similar to 1944's Phantom Lady, in which Ella Raines is an amateur detective slinking through nocturnal Manhattan trying to clear her boss of a murder charge. Now, the characters played by Ella and Lucy have a lot in common. Smart and spunky gals navigating a demimonde of sinister eccentrics, one of them a murderer. Robert Siadmak directed the influential Phantom Lady, so it's intriguing to note that Lourde is based on another Siadmak film, 1939's Piège, the last film he made in France before emigrating to Hollywood. In the title sequence, you'll see a story credit for the Frenchman, Russian, and Hungarian who wrote Piège. Now, this film had an arduous trek to the screen. It was the first production of an outfit called Oakmont Pictures, formerly Crystal Pictures, which would not last long. The company was created by James Nasser, who with his six brothers had created one of the most prominent movie theater chains in California, the Castro Theater in San Francisco, where I host my annual Noir City Film Festival, was built by the Nassers in 1922. Brother James wanted to expand from exhibition into production, and he partnered with a fledgling producer named Henry Kessler. They hired writer Norman Riley Rain to adapt Piège, which was also known by the English title Personal Column, since the killer lures his prey by placing ads in newspapers. Now, Norman Rain was top of the line having written for such prestigious pictures as The Life of Emile Zola, The Adventures of Robin Hood, and The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, all for Warner Brothers. In January 1946, Rain turned in a finished script, and the expectation was for shooting to begin that spring. Scheduled to star was Joan Leslie, her first picture since she'd freed herself via a well-publicized lawsuit from her indentured servitude to Warner Brothers. Leslie, an ingenue for years, was looking for more adult womanly roles, and this one fit like a tightly tailored gown. In late May 1946, Henry Kessler submitted the finished script to the production code office. And that's when the producers got a rude awakening. Boss censor Joseph Breen rejected it out of hand calling the sexual content suggestive and salacious. Breen was especially rough on new producers who weren't part of his exclusive boys club. Now, the project fell into limbo for several months, and Joan Leslie, eager to indulge her new freedom, left to take the lead in repeat performance at Eagle Lion. Nasser and Kessler then sold the stalled project to venerable producer Hunt Stromberg, an old friend of Joe Breen's, Stromberg quickly signed Douglas Sirk and George Sanders, who'd already made two films together, Summer Storm and A Scandal in Paris. A stellar supporting cast was assembled, featuring Cecil Hardwick, Charles Coburn, Joseph Kalea, Alan Mowbray, George Zucco, Alan Napier, and Alphonse Berger, who months later would have his role recast and reshot, with Boris Karloff replacing him. It's only a single scene, but Stromberg knew the value of Karloff's name on the marquee. If you will be kind enough to excuse me for a moment, I, I must prepare myself. Last to be signed was leading lady Lucille Ball, who had just played a similar role at Fox, shining as a spunky and sassy dame in the dark corner. Now, Stromberg had the author of that original story, Leo Rostin, do the final draft of Personal Column. 
And the changes must have been substantial because Norman Riley Rain's name is nowhere on the finished film. Now, whether it was Rostin's changes that made the difference or Stromberg's longtime friendship with Breen, the project got the green light from the PCA. The shoot was not easy. Labor unrest, which was tearing up the business all through 1946, forced production to move between General Service and Samuel Goldwyn Studios. Lucy suffered a run of bad luck, missing a week with the flu, having an arc light fall on her, and once passing out due to the tightness of the corset she had to wear. Personal column finally wrapped in February of 1947, but Hunt Stromberg was no longer happy with the title. He purportedly staged a nationwide publicity stunt, inserting ads in the personal columns of 25 major newspapers, soliciting a new title. The winner, so the story goes, was Lured. Now, through all the difficulties, director Douglas Sirk's deft hand never wavered. Aided by the glorious camera work of William Daniels, he turned in an atmospheric and suspenseful yarn, one that shows off the entire cast, and especially the two stars, to fabulous effect. Who'd have thought that George Sanders and Lucille Ball would be so sexy together? It's in black and white, it is a crime picture, but the elegance of Douglas Sirk is evident throughout. Here is Lured.
beauty that only death can enhance. Let's see the chief. And get off a TX to Edinburgh. Very good, sir. Oh, uh, tell Parrington to stand by. Stand by, sir. Well, what is it? We've just received another poem, sir. Right, uh, it was posted last night. Beauty that only death can enhance. For tonight, my friends, is her final dance. The P keys have fallen out of alignment. The serif of the R is sometimes not clearly visible. The small broken curve is found in all the letters E. There can be no doubt that this poem was typed on the identical machine used for the previous verses, classified under file Q 140X. Thank you. Typewriter paper of cheap common bond, eight and a half by eleven and a half. No rag content, manufactured by the Stanton Mills. Watermark, Victoria. Again, Victoria. No smudges. Typewriter ribbon, probably three months old. No fingerprints, as usual. Yeah. Ah, what's this? Glove prints. Probably suede gloves. Typewriter analysis, chemical analysis, fingerprints. <laughs> we had precisely the same information on the other seven letters. And the other seven girls disappeared. Exactly. There's a homicidal maniac loose somewhere in the vast honeycomb of London. A maniac with a weakness for young, pretty girls. And not a thing we've done has brought us one inch nearer his apprehension. There's not a man in the department, sir, has not been racking his brains over this case. Racking his brains? <laughs> That's a mistake. We can go on racking our brains till doomsday. And young, innocent girls will keep on disappearing, as will this one, whose fate has been sealed by this poem. No, it's not our brains we should rack. It's the brain that wrote this. A beauty that only death can enhance. For tonight, my friends, is her final dance. Fifty of you give all the rubbish in levelless dance partners. Fifty girls of your dreams to hold in your arms. Short dreams, tall dreams, blonde the brunette. Dance with one or dance with fifty. Only six pence to dance, gentlemen. Six pence to three. Thank you very much, Mr. Fifty. Don't rush off, dearie. Oh, now, wait a minute. I'm dizzy. Sorry. That's a bit Come on. That's enough of that. Move on. Oh, my aching toes. Thank goodness it's only two more hours. Two hours in this cement mixer are longer than a six-day bike race. In flew a dead duck. Come on. Take a turn, beautiful. What is it tonight? A sweepstake for zombies? I hope you two will be very happy. Thank you. Strike me pink if you aren't the prettiest little girl in the old place. The minute I laid my eyes on you, I said to myself, Oswald Pickering, that's me nine. There's the prettiest little girl in the old place. Take it easy, I don't dance. Milton's the name, Harry Milton. Just want to work. You can't take me home. I don't finish till 2 a.m. We can't go somewhere for a little drink, and I loathe etching. What's that? Oh, no, no, no. I'm a theatrical agent, miss. 
You've been watching me all evening. You've got personality. <laughs> How would you like to work in a really fine place? Oh, now don't tell me Buckingham Palace is installing a taxi dance wing. No, no, no. One of Fleming and Wilde's nightclubs. You've heard of Fleming and Wilde. The brightest spots in London. You're too beautiful for a slaughterhouse like this. <laughs> oh, I seem to have heard that before. Not from me, miss. I'm bonded. Mr. Fleming's scouring the town for beautiful girls. Ten quid a week and bonuses. Ten quid? Audition next week, Monday, nine o'clock. I'll be there, 9 a.m. sharp. Not morning, miss. Evening. Whoever heard of Mr. Fleming being up at nine in the morning? Oof. Look, an agent for a nightclub, ten pounds a oh, week. Oh, I'm not interested. What? Tonight's little Lucy's last dance, Sandra. Me and my big blue eyes are going bye-bye for good. What are you talking about? A man. Oh, he's so handsome. And he's got the charm of the devil himself. I'm going away with him. But who is he, Lou? Well, his name is John, and he comes from a very distinguished family. What? Oh, who's the lucky girl this time? Me? Oh, don't be jealous. There goes sixpence. Yeah? Spin around, sweetheart. Let's have a turn, Eddie. Strike me pink if you aren't the prettiest little girl in the old place. The minute I laid me eyes on you, I said to myself, Oswald Pickering, that's me name, there's the prettiest little girl in the old place. I thought the cat got your tongue, sweetie. Come on up, let's warm up. Lucy, John who? Where's he from? Here, who's paying for the stamps? I'd like to know, me or your lady friend. Yeah, shut up. Where'd you meet him? In the personal column. Here, what are you two talking about? Oh, Lou, not that way. It's dangerous. Not when I have my precious little friends to protect me. Elephants encircle her smooth white arm. Professor Harkness, I've been reading that stuff until I'm blue in the face. I've had the best cryptographers in London search them for some code or cipher or any kind of hidden meaning. I'll be surprised if you find any code. Whatever the criminal reveals in these jingles, he won't be aware of it. Subconscious. Nothing simple or direct. Inspector, I'm happy to say I've been able to identify the style. You mean you've got a line on him? He's actually a poet? He'd like to be. He's imitating one. Almost copied, in fact. Who? Which one? The poet that your man must know by heart is Charles Baudelaire. Baudelaire was obsessed with the notion that death is beautiful. Listen to this. A beauty still more beautiful in death. Your criminal has the same delusions, a beauty that only death can enhance. I see. But Baudelaire died years ago. Yes, quite horribly, in Paris, 1867. Mm. You're a murderer. If he's at all like Baudelaire, he'll be constantly in search of beauty and caught in it. A new lovely face will always appeal to him, or some unusual attractiveness will intrigue him, inspire him to destructiveness. He'll delight in variety, and never be quite content with what he finds. Sort of modern Don Juan. Mm, yes, you might say so. And I hope that this will throw some light on the subject, Inspector. Baudelaire, eh? Well, that might help. But at the moment, I don't see how. Well, thank you very much, Professor Harkness. And good day. Oh, look, Mr. Nelson, this is a chance of a lifetime. Chance of a lifetime? Yes, i give anything to get a job in a Fleming and Wilde show. Fleming and Wilde? What's wrong with your job here, eh? What's the matter with this place? It's nice. I like it. Well, I'm mad about it, too, Mr. Nelson. It's simply divine. Just loaded with opportunities. But look, I want that audition. Won't you let me off tonight? Please? Not unless you want to lose your job, girlie. You know we're short of girls around here, including your little friend Lucy Barnard. By the way, what happened to her? I don't know. I haven't heard from her. Maybe your landlady has. Did you try the house? That's a brilliant idea. Now, suppose you get back to your job like a good little girl. Goodbye, Duffy. Uh, give me a line, please. Well. Hello? Hello? Fleming and Wild Theatrical Enterprises? Hello? Hello? Mr. Fleming's secretary, please. 
Oh, just a moment. Who is it? Darling, it's not for you. She wants your secretary. She? Oh. Hello? Mr. Fleming's secretary? Yes? This is Sandra Carpenter. Sandra Carpenter. I was to come in tonight for an audition. Mr. Milton gave me a card. But I can't possibly get away. The manager, I... Would you tell Mr. Fleming for me? Uh, Mr. Fleming will be very disappointed, I'm sure. You have such a charming voice. Oh, well, I don't sing, you know. I dance. I bet you do, and beautifully. Perhaps we can arrange a private interview. You're intolerable. Uh, hold the line, please. Something's out of order here. Jealous's eyes are green, my dear. Don't let yours turn that dreadful color. You're incorrigible. Of course I am. I am an unmitigated cad. Now, carry on, my dear. Talk to me. Look here. Is it customary for Mr. Fleming's secretary to pass judgment for his boss? Mr. Fleming never makes a move without me. In fact, he very frequently has me take his young ladies out to dinner in order to talk things over. Thanks. I'll go hungry. Never squash, please. You're an American, aren't you? So? Mr. Fleming is quite partial to American girls. They have an irresistible way of putting a man on the defensive. Oh, Robert, you're in... impossible. <laughs> now, what were you saying? Uh, would it be against Mr. Fleming's Anglo-American policy to tell a girl when the next audition is, please? Uh, tomorrow night at nine. Can you make it? I think so. I guarantee that you'll see Mr. Fleming personally. Now, are you happy? I'm very happy. Then why don't you smile? All right, I'm smiling. Any more instructions, Mr. Sexton? Miss Carpenter. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello, Julian. Chanton has just delivered the architect's drawing. I feel rather like Napoleon after Waterloo. You sound more like Romeo after Julia closed the balcony window. The first girl that's hung up on me in years is well overdue. Take a look at these, Robert. I think the plans are perfect now. We shall have the finest nightclub in London. The entrance is larger than any of our other clubs, and Chanton has redesigned the dance area. I think the entrance is too large. I better take six feet off. The smaller the entrance, the more crowded the effect. The more crowded the effect, the more prosperous the impression. Always keep entrances crowded, Julian. Splendid, Robert. There isn't an entrepreneur in London that can hold a candle to you. There's no partner in the world like you, if appreciation is in order. Oh, fiddlesticks, my dear fellow. All I do is to keep an eye on the accounts. That's not so easy. It takes a magician to eat a profit out of my grandiose schemes. Let's take a look at the pretty little girls in their dancing shoes. Go ahead, girls. Are you coming, Julian? Here, a victim of poet killer. A horrible mess. Have you read this? <laughs> You're too sentimental. The eight little darlings probably ran off with professional charmers who promised them the riches of the Orient. You don't understand women, old boy. And that was the last you saw of Lucy Barnett. Yes. The night she said she was going away with some man. Her landlady reported that she left all her clothes, uh, everything she owned. Which wasn't very much, Inspector. Yeah. The man you say she went away with, did you know him? No. Never see him? All I know is she met him through the personal column. She answered an advertisement. Now, can you remember at all what the advertisement said? Yes, I have it right here. It was on her dressing table. Thank you. But a fine gentleman of means desires friendship with young, unattached girl in close photographs, intentions, marriage. Box 477. Now tell me, Miss Carpenter, what kind of a girl was this Lucy Barnett? Oh, just a nice kid. Not too smart, but not too dumb. Just the kind of fall for some Casanova with a smooth line. She believed no harm could ever come to her just because she wore a good luck charm, some silly little white elephant. Elephants? Did you say elephants? Yes. Around her wrist on a bracelet? Yes, how did you know? A girl by the name of Arlette Tomlinson disappeared about a year ago. Disappeared? Yes. A few days before she disappeared, we received this poem. Smile your last sweet, fragile smile, Arlette. For when the roses fade, the north wind whispers, Are you ready yet? This one we received last December. Move quickly to the rendezvous, my light of heart, Louise. Now worry if the gate is shut. Your lover has fate's key. The very next day, the parents of Louise Remington 
notified us that she had disappeared that night. Not a word of her since. Last week, we received this. Elephants encircle her. Elephants. I'm afraid you'll never see your friend again. Thank you, Gordon. Pardon, sir. Miss Carpenter, would you like to help us? There's nothing I wouldn't have done. Perhaps there's something you can do now. How long have you worked at this dance hall? Three months. What did you do before that? I came here from New York with a show. It folded in four nights. I was broke. Stand up. Would you mind raising your skirt? Uh-oh. Higher. How's that? Very nice. My compliments. Thank you. Sorry, but I had to. I don't get it. You will. Can you cook? Mm, kind of. No shorthand, typewriting? Enough to make me realize I better stick to show business. Why? No great matter. Can you do housework? Not if I can help it. Could you dress a wound? A bullet wound, perhaps? Perhaps. Well, I don't faint easily, if that's what you mean. Close your eyes. Now it comes. How large is this office? Oh, about 12 by 16. Where's the coat rack? Uh, between the door and the window. What color are the walls? Uh, dirty beige. Well, we don't spend the taxpayer's money in luxuries. Describe me, frankly, if you please. Well, you're kind of grayish, heavy set, six feet tall, and you probably have stomach trouble. You have a signet ring on your left little finger, a watch chain with a gold pendant, and you try to be hard-boiled, but you're really a softy. Satisfied? Quite. Very enlightening. Do I get the job? So you know what I've been aiming at. Female detective, isn't that what you've been testing me for? Exactly. Our police women are very clever, but the unknown person we seek only goes after young, beautiful girls. Thank you. Then I'm to be the bait. In our trap. The criminal will follow you in and we'll snap it shut. But how? You'll answer every ad in the personal column for young girls wanted unattached. We'll write your replies, but you keep the appointments. Miss Carpenter, there'll be danger. Great danger. Are you afraid? No, not yet. You'll be well guarded, but if you'd rather not. Oh, I'll help, of course. Thank you, Miss Carpenter. What about this one? Uh, one of the forces ladies is assigned to it, sir. You answered these, Gordon. Aye, sir. Miss Folliot wrote the letters in her own hand on a personal stationery. That leaves these four for you. Yes, sir. They're checked here in pencil. We'll continue to screen out the legitimate items. Report to me regularly. Yes, sir. What if I get in a jam, sir? We have a man responsible for you, but don't try to identify him. And this, just in case you need moral support. I hope I don't shoot myself. You won't. You're on the force now. Yes, sir. Good luck, Sandra. Thank you, sir. Nice skill. <laughs> Sorry, miss, but the position has been adequately filled. More than adequately, if you ask me. Precisely. Good day, miss. a soulmate. Oh, no, miss. It was my big brother. He's very nice. You would have liked him, but his regiment was called back this morning. He's most frightfully sorry. He asked me to bring you these. I do hope you're not too disappointed. Oh, no. Thank you very much. And you tell your big brother for me that I said good luck, will you? Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon.
I beg your pardon, but uh, are you waiting for someone? Well, yes, I have an appointment here. Oh, then you must be the one who wrote me. I am Charles Van Druten. Oh, you are. Uh, you need a model, right? How did you begin your letter? My letter? Um, dear sir, I, I hope to be the, the first to answer your... And the ending? I'm, um, I'm very anxious to make your acquaintance and to start work. Will I, will I do? Will you give me the job? You have no family? Family, no. Tonight, you can earn a pound. That's fine. Why do you accept so quickly? You know nothing about me, as yet. Well, I, um, I need the money, Mr. Van Druten. I have an ascent. Well, then, come. the others. Matilda. Matilda! She came. Come in, come in. We have no time to waste. Isn't she beautiful? A Van Druten figure. Now then, there is your dressing room. And Madame will assist you. If you will be kind enough to excuse me for a moment, I... I must prepare myself. Who is this Van Druten, anyway? Van Druten? Mais mademoiselle, vous savez pas? Why, he is the greatest designer that ever lived. Oh, a designer. He made this dress 25 years ago. Really? For a princess, a royal highness, Alicia. But none since. Poor soul. He is still living in those days. Why? What happened? Oh, mademoiselle. The princess never saw the dress. The design was stolen by his competitors in Paris. It broke his heart and his mind. I've cared for him ever since. Are you ready, my dear? Ready, mademoiselle? Maintenant, Charles. Beautiful, my child, beautiful. And now turn around, my dear. Ah, lovely as a painting by Gainsborough. Let's see. The house is packed. My dear child, you've never seen so distinguished an audience. Matilda, Her Excellency herself has just come in. Really? Orchestra, orchestra. Yes, Charlie, yes, yes. Not so loud. It hurts the ear. Pianissimo, pianissimo. Mais oui, Charles, naturellement, pianissimo. You embarrass me. You overwhelm me with guidance. Your royal highness. You're telling me. My lord, lady, Is he dangerous? welcome to my salon. Not if you humor him. Uh, but don't upset him. Mm -mm. I am honored by your patronage, inspired by your presence. Tonight, I offer for your approval my latest creations, exquisite, inimitable. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This gown was designed for the Venetian fate given at the palace of Her Royal Highness the Princess Alicia. Her Highness did me the extreme honor of wearing it herself. Your Excellency, I have never seen you looking so well. Would you be good enough to observe the delicacy of this line? Turn, my dear. Turn. Thank you. Lady. My poor captain, <laughs> your wife dragged you here, I presume. <laughs> Madame, may I draw your attention to the ingenious bodice, the lace, the subtle sleeve. Step over here, my dear, so Lady Winston can see you. Pardon me, please. How do you like my new model, eh? I presume you heard what happened to the last one. <laughs> but it's quite true, you know. That's why you're here. Oh, no, I... You work for them. Who? Colbert, the Broyer, the ones who are trying to destroy me. No. You'll never leave this room alive. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, mister. You got me all wrong. I, 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 I... Oh. Who is that? I, I don't know. I... Don't lie. I... Well, that's the man who sent me here. Your competitor, Colbert. Colbert? Yes, that's who it was. Colbert. Dancer, now you're working for the police. Oh, who are you? Barrett's the name, Miss H.R. Barrett. Been on the force 29 years. Well, for heaven's sake, why didn't you tell we me? You had to make sure you could take it, Miss, with all the goings on and everything. That's just great. He could have killed me, you know. He was awful close to it. But wasn't I right there all the time? I don't know. Didn't I popped right up when you needed me? Well, I guess so, but what happened to that horrible man? He landed right in my arms, miss. The constable on the corner's got him now. He's crazy, you know. Don't you worry about him, miss. A good night's rest and pleasant dreams. You'll be all ready for the next one. Oh, I hope you're right. But you want to learn to take care of your gun, Miss Carpenter. Here's your toy. Thanks. That's all right. Here's yours. 
Thanks. It's all right. What do you mean she's disappeared? Well, like I told you, Mr. Fleming. I goes back to the Palladium, but she don't work there anymore. Well, did you ask the proprietor where she went? The proprietor gave me the number of her flat, but the landlady says she cleared out two days ago, bag and baggage. And nobody knows where she is nor what she's doing. Blimey. Maybe the poet killer got the poor girl. Nonsense. She's one girl that can take care of herself. She wanted an audition then, and she probably wants one now. Coming, Robert? We mustn't be late. Sir Charles is a stickler for punctuality. Yeah, it's coming. You keep searching, Milton. Find the Sandra Carpenter and bring her here in person. Great Scott. Are you still concentrating on international affairs? You didn't hear her voice, Julian. I want to see the girl that goes with it. Mm. If anyone calls, I'll be at Sir Charles's. Now we come to Article 9. It will be quite oh. a pleasure in our caps to have you on our board of directors, Sir Charles. Oh, I like the idea very much. It's quite a departure for a stolid old banker. <laughs> well, your investment will be quite safe, I assure you. The club will be the last word in night spots, by far the most spectacular in London. As I was saying, gentlemen, now we come to Article 9. The party of the... Oh, 9. That reminds me. You will have to excuse me, Sir Charles. I have a very pressing engagement. Why, of course, old boy. Good night, Julian. But, Mr. Fleming, I've not finished yet. Uh, Mr. Wire will hear you out. He has the train, dear. Good night, Mr. Wilberforce. Good night. Well? Article 9. I beg your pardon, Sir Charles. The advertisement. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Wolf Wars, will you please? Yes, Maxwell? It must be in before 11, sir. The aristocratic home offers unusual opportunity for an attractive woman heading to the Square. Mm hmm. Send this off, Maxwell, by the way, will you? I'm sorry, gentlemen. <coughs> Domestic crisis. We've lost three Marie? of our mates in the last six months, and all without getting notice. It's most annoying. Carry on, Wilberforce. before. Yes, yes, yes. As I was saying, now we come to Article 9. Mm-hmm. That's more to the point, isn't it, Maxwell? Turn around. Very nice. I think you'll make a satisfactory parlor maid. Maid? Oh, it says here, unusual opportunity for unattached... I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Really? No, oh, you see, your advertisement was in the personal column, not the want ad. Was it? How odd. There must have been an error. You're not married? No. You have no steady male friend? No, not even an unsteady one. Then perhaps this job will not be as routine as you imagined. I would say it has rather interesting possibilities for anyone as attractive as you. The girls who were here before you all went on to much... Marie, tend to your own business. But she's quite right about the other girls who were with us. They've all done very well. I see. Well, if there's really a chance for advancement, I... Would you like to see my references? I'm not interested in references as much as in character. I like your character. I can see that from here, Mr... Uh... Maxwell. Lyle Maxwell. But in front of the others, you must call me Sir. Yes, sir. Marie? Yes, sir? Show her her room and inform her of her duties. Yes, sir. What's new, besides walking my lady's blood out? My lady's butler's got ideas. I don't blame him, but I'd like to push his face in. I don't mean that. He hasn't even held my hand yet. Oh. But he does peek at me around corners when he doesn't think I'm looking. So? What's a six-letter word meaning ancient tyrant? I don't know, but I have something I should tell. The chief? Mm -hmm. Then get going, lass. Will you watch Caesar for me? The things I do for the force. Caesar. Caesar, that's it. Scotland Yard, extension five. 
Inspector Temple, please. Sandra Carpenter calling in. Yes? Miss, Miss Carpenter, put her on. Yes, Miss Carpenter? I think I've run into plenty of something, Inspector. Three girls were here before me who left for parts unknown. Did you get their names? Well, I don't dare shoot questions too fast. Hold on a minute. Send a man to 18 Candleworth Square. Census report. Yes, sir. We'll get the names. The butler calls himself Maxwell. Lyle Maxwell. Maxwell? Check Lyle Maxwell in the files. Lively. Now. Yes, sir. He said that the advertisement got the personal column by mistake. He lied. I have the original copy just as it was sent to the inquirer. Address personal column. Play this Maxwell along. And take Monday night off. Where to? Ionian Hall. A man who signs himself music lover has advertised for a beautiful maiden to share his ecstasy. He'll leave your ticket at the box office. I'll send his letter along in case you need to identify yourself. Yes, sir. Monday night. That means evening clothes, Inspector. That's what your expense account is for, my dear. Use it. Don't think I won't. Carry on. Yes, sir. Trial date on Maxwell, sir. Thank you. Lyle Maxwell, aliases Maxime Duval, Martin Weishaupt. Believed to be born in Hamburg, passport irregularities noted. Has left and entered the United Kingdom four times since January 7. Mm, very interesting. And make a note for Inspector Barrett. Ionian Hall, 8.30, Monday night. White tie and tails. Franz Schubert. Symphony number eight in B minor, unfinished. Unfinished. Ticket reserved for music lover, please. Here it is, madam. Thank you. Of all people, since when have you become a music enthusiast? I thought I might find some talent among the highbrows. This is no hunting ground for you, my dear fellow. <laughs> you got a seat reserved? Um, no, I haven't. Let's sit together. All right, fine. Then you can nudge me when I'm supposed <laughs> to applaud. What have you left? All I have left is a box that has just returned. I'll take it.
I think I need a drink. A drink? She's stunning, isn't she? Very. I'll see you later. And yours, madam? Champagne cocktail, please. Champagne cocktail. I'll make that two. Two champagne cocktails. And yours, sir? Whiskey and soda. Whiskey and soda. Very good, sir. Thank you. You're alone, aren't you? I'd like to be. Oh, some sort of phobia. Fear of meeting the wrong people. Waiter, an aspirin tablet, please. Your aspirin, sir? Thank you. He must be short-sighted or a fool. Waiter, how much, please? Oh, allow me. Look here, I'm not in the habit of letting... Uh, hold on. Say that again. What? Talk to me. Say, is it customary for Mr. Fleming's secretary to... Oh, oh. Uh, so you remember me, too. Mm, unpleasant memories are sometimes hard to shake off. Why didn't you come to the audition? I had Mr. Fleming sold on you. He had the stage all decked out in American flags, and he sent me all over London to find you some American beauty roses. And you didn't show up. And I'll tell you why. I got a better job. One with a future. No red tape, at least not your kind. You wanted to pay, sir? Uh, yes, for both. Thank you for the drink. I'm uh, being paged. Will you excuse me? Good change, sir. Who's that bird? Bird? Shirley Barrett, you noticed his fangs. One of those, huh? Mm-hmm. What about music lover? Obviously, he didn't show up. Well, maybe he did. Maybe he looked you over and decided it was too risky to meet you here. Maybe. Get your coat. No? Yeah, we'll force him to contact you in some place within around a thousand miles. Besides, all this musical uproar is giving me a blooming headache. Look, Barrett, you go home and make with a nice stag. I want to stay and listen to an orchestra I don't have to dance to for a change. Hey, wait a minute. What's, uh, what's a five-letter word meaning excavator? I don't know. Besides, I don't want to miss Mr. Schubert's unfinished B minor. Unfinished B minor. Minor, that's it, of course. <laughs> Your car is waiting. My car? Yes, madame. Way, madam. What is this? The gentleman with whom you had the appointment was unable to come. He asked me to take you to him. This way, madam, if you please. This is one of Fleming and Wilde's places, isn't it? Yes, madam, the newest and most splendid. Check, please. Oh, I'll remember you, madam. Au revoir, madam. May I take you to your table? Mm -hmm. I wanted you to see what you'd missed by snubbing me. Distinguished clientele, food and wine for gourmets, devastating music. You certainly go to a lot of trouble making your contacts. Not for every contact. Really? A drink would improve me no end if you'd drink it. Well, if a drink could do that, more power to it. Excuse me. Uh, Pierre? Yes, Mr. Fleming? A bottle of Mums, 37. A bottle of Mums, Mr. Fleming. Is anything wrong? My IQ, it must have been flying at half-mast. 
Mr. Fleming's secretary, huh? No, it wasn't my idea. You started it. Oh, did I? Well, I must admit I rather enjoyed the job while it lasted. Did you? Except there was no future to it. That's why I gave it up. You're not very talkative tonight, are you? Shall we drink a toast to your friend who didn't show up? Those X-ray eyes of yours don't miss a trick, do they? Not when it concerns me. How could it in this case? It occurred to you that I might be the one you were waiting for. Yes, as a matter of fact, it has. Did you send me that letter? I might as well own up to the confounded thing. I bungled it, didn't I? But at least the result was the same. I did meet you at the concert. Why didn't you stay until the end of the concert if you're such a music lover? I had more important things on my mind. Such as? Planning an evening for you. Like the song? I no longer laugh at love and laugh. Yes, very much. Come what may, what you ask of me, I'll give night or day. For as long as I shall live, while there's you love needs no reason. I am yours for always, darling, all for love. You know what it's called? All for love. I've never heard it sound like that before. You didn't write that letter. No? Your technique is entirely different. I have it your way. I've had mine. Would you like to dance, or is that reserved for auditions? I'd like to very much. I'll pass judgment this time. Darling, your successor. For as long as she can hold him. Obviously, it's just the beginning. The old Fleming pattern. It's always the same. With a graceful bow, he takes her in his arms. And they dance a few steps in beautiful, harmonious silence. While his busy little brain composes charming little speeches. Now he begins his campaign to sweep her off her feet. He tells her how exciting she is, how fortunate he is, and how fond he is of red hair, or black or purple hair, as the case may be. Don't say it, Mr. Fleming. Let me guess. I'm sure it's been said before. Have her sing it again, please. I'd be glad to. Maxwell, come in. Sit down, my dear, sit down. I'm sorry to disturb your afternoon's rest. It's quite all right, Mr. Maxwell. But there's something I want to tell you. We've talked of advancement, haven't we? Yes. I've watched you closely, and you've done very well. Thank you. Now, this evening, you're going to meet a very influential friend of mine. Oh? Uh, Mr. Nicholas Moriani. He's coming here. If you make a good impression on him, your future is assured. What do you mean? You haven't traveled much, have you? No, just from New York here. Never seen South America? Never felt the warmth of its sun? Ah, uh, what gaiety and color. Magnificent. The rolling pampas, the towering peaks, the charm of the cities and the people. 
hospitable, and rich. Oh, don't kid me, Mr. Maxwell. That stuff's strictly for dreams. Uh, no. Mr. Moriani has it in his power to provide many opportunities for a deserving girl. Gee, I can see myself in a setting like that. But what would I do in South America? Mr. Moriani has many properties. You might start as you did here, but the heights you might reach are unlimited. There. Oh, honestly, I'd give notice right now. The boat doesn't sail to Wednesday. Oh, I'd love another boat trip. What's the name of it? It's one of his boats. There's one thing I don't like about it, though. What? Leaving this house here, my job with you. I've been very happy. I'll be sorry to see you go. You will miss me, won't you? Just a little? Very much. You know, Mr. Maxwell, I've liked you from the start. Have you? <laughs> I've often thought that maybe... Maybe someday I might join you there. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Both of us sailing away on the good ship Moriani. Doriatis. Moriani is my friend's name. He, he's a very fine fellow. You'll like him, Moriani. I'll put in a good word for you. I'm sure you will. Oh, Sandra. Yes, sir? This is Mr. Moriani, the gentleman I was telling you about. I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Moriani. Mr. Maxwell was telling me that... Yes? ...that you work miracles. What for dessert, Max? Ah, your favorite. You may serve Mr. Moriani's dessert now, Sandra. Yes, sir. Hey, yes. take this. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Would you like your coffee now, Mr. Moriani? Hmm? A coffee? Later. With brandy. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Moyani. Oh, should be from over here. It's I... all right. I'm sorry, sir. Sit down. I want to talk to you. Thank you. Delicious. What are you really looking for? Oh, a better job, more money. A little fun? Fun. I see. What any girl wants. <laughs> oh, Fleming, you're incorrigible. I'm going to try that on Chitty Charm. Uh, oh, Maxwell. <laughs> yes, sir? The brandy. Uh, the good brandy, Maxwell. No, I know Sir Charles got the best of the bargain. <laughs> Sugar and cream, Mr. Moriani? No. Black. Yes, sir. Is everything satisfactory, Mr. Moriani? Sure, Max. Hmm? Send it away. Oh, Sandra, five glasses for cognac. Yes. Uh, would you mind, Mr. Moriani? It's Sir Charles. All right, all right. All right. Thank you. In the library. Yes, sir. Isn't she beautiful? Who is she? Why, nobody, nobody at all. Just an ordinary girl. Pretty, smart. She's too smart. Huh? I don't want her in the deal. But... What did you tell her? The usual what thing. What did you tell her? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Did you tell her the name of the boat? You blithering idiot. Well, that solved the problem. Uh, have a brandy. Uh, thank you. Yep. That should do it. Right. Well, Fleming, have a brandy, old boy. Brandy, sir? Robert, for heaven's sake, where are you? Be back in five minutes. I'm sorry, Sir Charles. Sandra. Oh, no, you don't. Not this time. I beg your pardon, sir, but I'm not permitted to associate with the guests. I've combed all London for you. What on earth are you doing in this idiotic costume? Making a living, sir, as a parlor maid. Uniform is required. Oh, a living, eh? So this is the job with the future. Uh, if you please. <laughs> May I be of any service to you, sir? 
Is there anything that you want, sir? In the kitchen? Uh, yes, I, I... I lost a button off my coat, and uh, this young lady is going to be good enough to sew it on. Yes, I was going to find some. Uh, do you have the button, sir? Uh, no, unfortunately. Would you be good enough to pitch one for me, a black one? Very well. A black one. Sandra. Please. Oh, couldn't you get out for a minute? I'm on duty, sir. Sir, the lady's maid will take care of the button for you. Sandra. Yes, Mr. Maxwell. Take this out, please. Excuse me, sir. Your button, sir. Huh? Your button. Oh, thank you. walking alone. I thought I'd get a friend of mine. Why didn't you ask me? We're friends, aren't we? <laughs> Surely. Max told me how friendly you are. You're very much interested in our plan, too. Aren't you? Well, of course. What girl wouldn't be? South America must be wonderful. I, I, I really shouldn't stay out too long. That's I, uh... perfectly all right. Max won't mind it as long as you're with me. No, I oh, incidentally, not. who were you calling? A man? Yes, a very old friend of mine. Don't lie to me. I'm not lying. What are you up to? Nothing. What are you? <laughs> What are you up to? Miss <laughs> Queen. <laughs> Nothing. What'd you tell him? Robert! Robert! Robert, Oh, I'm so glad you came. So am I. I was beginning to think you didn't appreciate my advances. Oh, but I did. I do. I, I, I thought of you, but I couldn't. Oh, darling, you knew. I couldn't get you out of my mind. Hello? Pardon me, I thought I had someone crying. What's this? Blimey, he's a cool one, isn't he? Look, do me a favor, will you? Anything you say, Governor. This is a case for the police. Help me with him. I've got to get my girl home. Please, it is, Governor. Leave it to me. You take care of the young lady. Thanks. <laughs> By the way, who is our sleeping Romeo? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I never saw him before. All of a sudden, there he was, pushing me around. And well, you're I... not such a bad sort of bat. What do you mean? Look what he did for me tonight. It's true. We're engaged. I'm going to marry the man. Isn't it wonderful? Congratulations, well, my dear. Step I congratulate you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. We well, trust Thank you'll you. be extremely happy. Hi, we, we do indeed. Thank you. But uh, I, I hope you didn't reveal your connections with Scotland Yard. 
No, thanks to Barrett, I didn't have to. Did you get them all? Yes, we raided the Doriatis after arresting Moriani and his playmates. Gordon has sent traces on their operations in South America. The thanks all go to you, Sandra. Incidentally, Sir Charles is very grateful for our bit of house cleaning. He was quite shocked when he learned that his downstairs was used as a recruiting station for apprentices in crime. <laughs> I can imagine. You will let me know the minute you have any news of Lucy, won't you? Of course. Well, isn't my guardian angel going to say goodbye to me? Well, when you leave, my wings are gone. Incidentally, that man of yours, he better be good to you. That's all. If you ever need a friend, just remember H.R. Barrett. I will. <clears throat> when is the wedding? You'll send me an invitation, I hope. Of course, but first Robert's giving me an engagement party. Tuesday at 9. You'll be sure to come? I'll be there. Goodbye, my dear, and God bless you. Thank you, Inspector. <clears throat> you say they're a gang of jewel thieves, sir, but what have the girls got to do with it? And where do they get them? Oh, in various ways, such as the personal column. They round up young girls who are attracted by promises of luxury, trip to a foreign country with all expenses paid, guarantee of an easy job, and they're shipped out. And when they land, they get the lowdown. Exactly. Some of them are placed as hostesses in nightclubs if they're attractive enough. Others go into the best families as domestic servants. They're told what to do and they do it. But if they rebel or talk, they disappear permanently. Well, thank goodness the case is closed. Aye, the worst one in my experience, Mercer, the way he dragged on. Sorry, gentlemen, but I don't believe this case is closed. What? Do you think a gang would deliberately warn Scotland Yard before each of its victims disappeared? How do you mean? Do you think they'd write poems, studiously copying the style of one of the most fantastic madmen that ever lived, Baudelaire? Does that have the earmarks of a gang? Well, sir, what is your theory, then? I think we'll find in South America many of the girls who've been missing, but not Louise Remington, nor Arlette Tomlinson or the other girls immortalized by our modern Baudelaire, and not Lucy Barnett. No, gentlemen, we are not through. But, sir, you let Miss Carpenter go. Well, she's won her spurs. She deserves to be happy. Charles, take the parcels into the drawing room. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello, Julia. My colleague and my conscience, before I met you. Robert's told Robert's you so much. Robert's told you all about you. <laughs> Hello, Julian. Hello, Sandra. Robert is a very lucky fellow. Persistent. Uh, Julian, you haven't lived until you've shopped for a trousseau with the prettiest redhead in the world. Charming, but rather expensive experience, I should imagine. <laughs> That'll be all. Thank you, Charles. Oh, so here's where the home fires burn for those two celebrated bachelors. A long time, too, eh, Julian? Yes. Beautiful. Really beautiful. Well? Aren't you coming in? I'll leave her alone, Julian. She's trying to picture how the room will look after she's rearranged the furniture. I am not. Not until Wednesday. Oh, I feel that I'm barging in on you two. No, 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 no. I'm moving up to town. Julian, you're not leaving this house. Now, my dear Sandra. My dear Robert, if our marriage is going to make your best friend homeless, the deal is off. Oh, really? Really. Well, let's discuss it over a glass of sherry. Yes, Mr. Robert? Ah, Mrs. Miller. Uh, Mrs. Miller, this is the future lady of the house, Miss Carpenter, for the present. How do you do, Mrs. Miller? Uh, will you see that the spare room is in order? Miss Carpenter will be using it on Tuesday before the reception. Will you take all this paraphernalia upstairs? Oh, Mrs. Miller, my engagement party dress is in this one. Please be especially nice to it when you hang it up, won't you? I'll be careful, Miss. Thank you. We should toast the bride, don't you think? Oh, Julian, I'm not a bride yet, and I'm very superstitious. Anyhow, it's an occasion for us. Here's to Sandra. Gentlemen, I thank you. Now, Julian, aren't you going to claim your prerogative? You don't object to kissing your husband's business partner from time to time, do you? Well, that depends on how many business partners you have. <laughs> Julian, go ahead. I haven't the lady's permission. Oh. Uh, that's all that's required. <laughs> now, Sandra, I want to show you the rest of the house. An introduction to my new job? Yes. Besides, I want to kiss you, too.
Reynolds, sir. The chief was right. Well, Gordon? It's come, sir. Another poem. The loveliest one reveals the tiger's lair, knowing not what strange love's lurking there, wearing shimmering stars on silken cloth of blue. Alas, tis death with whom she'll have a rendezvous. I'm afraid, Gordon, there's not much chance for this poor girl either. With her dress of shimmering stars. There. Looks like you walked through a shower of stars, doesn't it, miss? That's how I feel. Believe me, I'm getting awfully fond of this cloud I'm traveling on. Sounds like Mr. Fleming lately. He's a bit giddy too, miss. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Stars in your dress are only surpassed by these. Stars in my eyes. Thank you, Julia. Where's Robert? Oh, Robert won't be long. Oh, he isn't ready yet. Shall we wait in his study? It isn't everyone who has this privilege. Oh? This is the one place that he likes to call his own. Well, I guess this settles once and for all the old question of who takes longer to dress, a man or a woman. Well, Robert's a very vain fellow, my dear. And vanity takes its own time. Is that supposed to be news? Look at all the encouragement he's had. Robert, dear, I anticipate loving you forever. You're Margaret. He thinks that's where Maggie made her first mistake, no doubt. Uh-oh, there's another one. Remember the... Oh, don't take it down, Julian. I wasn't complaining. You might if you read this one. I'm sure Robert will thank me for disposing of this particular skeleton. I'll go up and see what's keeping him. Robert! Robert! <laughs> Bad legs. Mm hmm. something. I love you? Yes. Were you doubting it? No. Did you know her? This on the eve of my wedding with a house full of guests coming. No, I don't think so. Am I supposed to know her? I don't know. I'm glad you're not the jealous kind. Or I'd have to take up farming. So I tell you how beautiful you look. Well, we can't go into that now. I want to show you off. Come in. I beg pardon, sir. Mr. Harley Temple has arrived. Oh, yes. Shall I show him into the drawing room? Well, would you ask him to come in here, please? He's a friend of mine. Oh, I'm so glad you could come. Mr. Temple, uh, my fiancé, Mr. Fleming. May I offer my felicitations to you both? Oh, thank you. I wonder if I could have a word with Sandra. We'll join you in a minute. Yes, of course. Where did you get that gown? This? At Lorraine's on Bond Street. Who was with you? Why, Robert and the chauffeur. And... Robert? What are you driving at? The loveliest one reveals a tiger's lair, knowing not what strange love's lurking there, wearing shimmering stars on... Looks like I'm next, doesn't it? Oh, you're wrong. Robert didn't send this. I didn't say he did. That's what you hinted. I hinted nothing. I only present you with a fact. Your life is in great danger. This poem... What is it, Sandra? No. 
What is it? Have you discovered something? Fleming's desk. But he has hundreds of pictures in here like this. They don't mean anything. And the bracelet. I'm sorry, you two. Oh, darling, everyone's here. Mr. Fleming, I'd like to ask you a question. Where did you get this? I? That's not mine. It was in your desk. Oh, it was? Yes, please tell him why. Well, darling, I would if I knew. You can probably get those by the hundred at any novelty shop. Mr. Fleming, this bracelet belonged to one of eight girls who have disappeared from London. Well, why should that concern me? This is the girl who wore it. She was a friend of mine. We've been trying to trace her. We? Oh, Robert, please try to understand. I was working with Inspector Temple. Inspector? Oh. So that's what brought you to me. Oh, no. Well, you certainly took me in. But, Robert... Inspector, tell me, what made you decide to put her on my trail? Did I look dangerous? Darling, it wasn't that way. She was only doing her duty, Mr. Fleming. Duty? I congratulate you on your skill at making love in the line of duty. How else could you have caught me red-handed in my own trap? Oh, Robert, that's cruel. Not at all. It's complimentary. I admire your resourcefulness. You have the evidence, the pictures, the bracelet. In fact, you have everything, except the eight girls. Mr. Fleming, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to come with me. Robert, just tell us where the bracelet came from. All right. I took it from the body of a girl that I murdered. You believe that all along, haven't you? No, no, Robert, I haven't. Oh, look, I... Angel. The show's over. Stop acting. Come, come, Mr. Fleming. Surely you have more than this to say. Well, what do you expect me to say? You found some pictures in my desk, together with a rather hideous trinket, and so you consider me to be an abductor of girls, a maniac who's hidden the bodies. Is this your typewriter? Yes. It's the machine on which the poems were typed. You said that before. Do you use paper of this sort, Watermark Victoria? My secretary buys my paper. I don't know one kind from another. Mr. Fleming, on the night of February the 3rd, a girl named Louise Remington disappeared. Can you tell us where you were that night? It was a Monday night. Your hotel dinner bill that night was signed at 8.37 p.m. You left the hotel... Great Scott, you expect a man to remember a date almost a year old. You'll be surprised what a man will remember when it's important. Inspector Temple, I don't remember where I was on August the 10th, on July the 20th, or on September the 4th. I've been out somewhere every night for years. You can ask anyone in London. Precisely. And very clever, too. A man who is seen out publicly night after night doesn't have to remember where he was. He's already established a carte blanche alibi for any night of the year. And, uh, and what about the photograph of Lucy Barnett? It was found in your desk. Along with about 50 others. I don't know these girls. I may have seen them, I may have talked to them, I may even have hired them. There are probably half a dozen photographs in my mail today of girls wanting jobs. Mr. Fleming, here are letters from Lucy Barnett, Arlette Tomlinson, Louise Remington, and Sandra Carpenter. Each answers an ad in the personal column for young girl wanted. A photograph of the applicant was in each case attached to the letter. Hardly my method of selecting girls. No. Mr. Fleming, these letters were found in the files of your office. My office? Yes, Mr. Fleming. Your office. You, uh, you met Miss Sandra Carpenter at the Ionian Hall through an advertisement. That's absurd. But that's what you told her. I made that up. I you mean you lied to her? Suppose you can call it that. Then it seems, Mr. Fleming, that you are capable of lying. Mr. Fleming, why did you happen to go to the concert that particular night? I told you I was bored. But you told us earlier that you did not go to concerts because they bored you. It was a different kind of boredom that night. It was indeed. You knew Sandra Carpenter would be there. How could I possibly have known? You advertised in a personal column calling yourself music lover. She answered that ad. Her reply was in your files. That's how you knew. No, I happened to see her at the concert. She was waiting for someone. How did you know that? I was sitting right behind her. And sizing her up. She caught my eye, yes. She's beautiful. Caught your eye? Hmm. I saw a bearded man sit down next to her. She showed him the note and then he left. It was really a perfect opening. Ah, so that you could carry on with your plans. 
I had no plans. It was a coincidence. Coincidence? It's coincidence that you own a Westminster typewriter. It's coincidence that certain keys are out of alignment. It's also coincidence that you use Victoria paper. And of course it's merely coincidence that pictures of missing girls were in your possession and that letters they wrote in answer to personal column advertisements were found in your files. Oh, for heaven's sake, I don't know how they got there. I don't know. I see. Well, then, I suppose it's nothing but coincidence that on the last poem we received, describing the dress Sandra bought in your presence, your fingerprints were clearly marked. That's my fingerprint? Yes, Mr. Fleming, your fingerprint. And we anticipate finding more such evidence. Speaking. Chief says you can bring the man back. He's found something. Righto. That's all, men. She was strangled before she was put into the river. Note the bruises, thumb marks on throat, and the distinct discoloration. The body's been in the water at least two weeks, if not more. There were stones in the burlap wrapping to weigh it down. Thank you, gentlemen. Ah, that must be the missing persons bureau. Temple speaking. You have the pictures of the body? You check the identification? And the name? We had better luck dragging the riverbed than digging in your garden, Mr. Fleming. Look closely, please. Do you know her? No. I think you did, Mr. Fleming. Her name was Lucy Barnard. Does that help you to recognize her? No. No, I've never seen Robert with this girl. But surely, Inspector, you don't believe that Robert strangled this Barnard girl and then drowned her and possibly any number of others? I didn't say he did, Mr. Wilde. I said that everything thus far points to Fleming's guilt. You could do much to establish his innocence if you could prove where he was on certain nights. February the 3rd, April the 17th, May the 9th, July the 20th, August the 10th. I can look up my records. We've already taken the liberty of checking your records, with a search warrant, of course. There's no indication in your diary as to Fleming's nightly movements. However, we do know from it where you were. Incidentally, Mr. Wilde, why did you happen to go to the concert that night? I? I've been attending the concert every Monday night for years. I see. And Fleming just happened to go that night? Yes, but... And the rest of the evidence? It could have been planted on Robert, every bit of it. Including his fingerprints on that last poem we received? That proves nothing either. Read that. Now your fingerprints are on it. And yours, Mr. Wilde. I gladly admit that it proves my point doubly. Someone could have tricked Robert, placed all those exhibits that you value so highly in his desk, his files. Who, for instance? Oh, any number of people. Some jealous woman oh, who, see. one of the many employees in the club, his secretary, mine, one of the servants, his chauffeur, even I. I've thought of that too, Mr. Wilde. We've questioned any number of possible suspects. Did you plant the evidence? What do you think, Inspector? I think Fleming could do a good deal worse than engage you as his barrister. 
The simplest way for you to establish Fleming's innocence now, Mr. Wilde, is to establish someone else's guilt. Good night. Good night, Inspector. Oh, Miss Carpenter. Did you, uh... It's no use, Miss. He hasn't changed his mind about seeing you. But you have to. I've got to see him. This is all wrong. Let me go in, please. Hold on, Miss. He's got another visitor in there now anyway. And one at a time. That's the rule. Who's in there? Mr. Wilde, Miss. Oh. Have you been able to do anything? I've got you the best counsel in England. Sir Roland Harcourt has agreed to defend you, and I assure you he'll be more than a match for Mr. Temple. It isn't Temple he'll be fighting. What do you mean? It's the evidence. How in heaven's name was he able to get it? All that evidence pointing to me, taken from my files, even from my own home, piece by piece, all carefully labeled with my name. Every crime ingeniously laid at my door. Who would want this to happen to me? I've spent an eternity here trying to discover that, but I can't. Julian. You think I'm guilty too, don't you? No. No, I don't, Robert. And I don't think the evidence against you is conclusive. Is that Harcourt's opinion? Well, uh, not exactly. I... Listen, Robert. Harcourt has the opinion that the evidence against you is formidable, but merely circumstantial. Men have been hanged on circumstantial evidence. Robert, you mustn't talk like that. You mustn't even think like that. The experts call it circumstantial evidence. I call it a rope dangling over my head. Robert! Harcourt is confident that at least he can save you from that and get you off with a life sentence. A life in prison? I'd rather confess and have the rope. But Robert, listen, you mustn't... Robert! Robert, let me talk! Oh. He despises me, Julian. I saw it in his face. Robert doesn't despise you, son. <laughs> He just doesn't understand that his circumstances, not you working against him. But I could make him understand, Julian. If only he'd let me talk to him. Perhaps I can persuade him to see you. He needs you badly, of course. Yes? How extraordinary. Well, thank you for letting me know. Come in. Inspector Temple. Good morning, Inspector. Good morning, Mr. Wilde. Are you free? Yes. Yes, of course. Sit down. Thank you. I've been thinking about our discussion the other day. You gave me rather a different view of the case. Really? In what way? I've come to the conclusion that you were right. Fleming is not guilty. Good. I'm glad you agree. And yet you said the facts were indisputable. Too much so. Too many of them and too perfect. Facts must have psychological cement, Mr. Wilde. In Fleming's case, they haven't. So they fall apart. Oh. What do you mean by that, Inspector? Let's take a look at this fellow Fleming. He's a healthy man, the sort that lives with the world. He's vain, but... What man attractive to women isn't? He has a temper. But who with imagination and flair hasn't? He has tremendous enthusiasm for life and people. And he's very honest about it. I thoroughly agree. He envies no one. He has a great love of beauty, and he makes no bones about that either. Agreed? Quite. Quite. Mr. Wilde, I've described the type of man who does not commit murder. He doesn't have to kill in order to win. Our criminal does. I'm afraid I can't quite follow you, Inspector. i lead you slowly. Our criminal is a man who is afraid to meet women openly in the presence of others. So he advertises in the personal column, correct? Perhaps. This man has no brilliant approach to a social existence. He leads a hidden life and finds compensation by indulging in secret, incredible fantasies. How can you know that? The poems, Mr. Wilde. The imaginings of a man with grotesque ideas of romance. A man who finds his pleasure in destroying beauty rather than in making love to it. Interesting. To this man's way of thinking, death is more beautiful than life. 
Unfortunately, he's compelled to express this thought. Oh, come, Inspector. Surely that's a slim reason for murder. Mr. Wilde, that kind of expression requires murder. Really, Inspector, I should never have suspected you of such remarkable insight. Mr. Wilde, may I have your copy of Baudelaire? Baudelaire? Yeah. But that's a very unusual request, Inspector. This is a very unusual case, Mr. Wilde. There's a quotation I should like to read you. Don't think I have a copy here. I'm sure you have. You are right, as usual, Inspector. Thank you. Now, let's see. Let's see. Ah, here we are. Now listen to this. A shrine of death and beauty is the sky drowned in red blood. The sun gives up his breath. Don't be afraid, my sweet, to die, for beauty is still more beautiful in death. The poems we received were written in exactly the same meter and style. In fact, our criminal must have copied Baudelaire. Very odd. Did Fleming have access to your books? The door between our offices was never locked. But Fleming hasn't the faintest idea who Baudelaire is. He never reads poetry. He doesn't like it. It gives him nothing he couldn't get from a woman's smile. You follow my reasoning? Yes. I believe I do. Then we both know who the real murderer is. You seem to relish the cat and mouse game, Inspector. Aren't you enjoying it too? Yes, I am. So let's go on. I assume that you are hinting that I might be the murderer. Very well, then. We must assume that I lured eight innocent girls away and disposed of them. The police had no clue. I was quite safe. Why, then, did I risk sending that last poem to you? That, Mr. Wilde, was the one point I couldn't understand. But it's the critical point, Inspector, the crux of your case. I didn't understand until quite recently why you incriminated Fleming. Oh? It's very simple, really. You're in love with Sandra Carpenter. Yes, I am. I confess, Inspector, that you built up a superb case, theoretically, of course. Incidentally, it would be ridiculous to try and prove it in a court of law. Mr. Wilde, I think you'll make a great mistake if you underestimate the courts of this country. I confess you've made me feel positively guilty. Sent a chill of terror up my spine. I confess all this. But surely we needn't play this little game any further, Inspector. Not in light of the glaring fact that I learned just before you came into this room. What fact is that? Don't you know? Didn't you come from your office? No. What are you driving at? Why not half an hour ago, Robert Fleming confessed. Get me Scotland Yard, extension four. Mercer, Temple here. What about Fleming? When? Oh. Thank you. Mr. Wilde, I owe you a most abject and profound apology. Good day.
quite sure you ordered my cab, Mrs. Miller. Oh, yes, indeed. That must be it now. I couldn't bear to be alone, Julian. I can stay here, can't I, Julian? For just a little while? Of course. I have a cab waiting. You need a rest, Sandra. You must go upstairs and lie down. I'll send for Mrs. Miller. She'll give you a sedative. You need a rest, Sandra. No, please, Julian. I want to talk to you. I've got to talk to someone. Robert won't let me go in. Inspector Temple won't even listen to me. I thought there was hope, but Robert had no right to throw his life away. He couldn't compromise on a life in prison, Sandra. A life bare of beauty. That's why he chose death. Why should he die for a crime he didn't commit? He confessed, Sandra. He couldn't have done it. He was so gentle with me. He's good, Julian. A woman knows. She can tell by the touch of a man's hand, by, by a kiss. Don't think any more, Sandra. Lie down and rest. I'll dismiss the cab. You were going to send the cab away. Oh, no, Sandra, not yet. Not yet. We shall be needing it later. But why, Julian? Why should we need it? So that we may go away together. I didn't want to go alone. Well, let's go now then, Julian. Well, let's go now. No, no. I wanted to talk to you alone like this for a long time. Sit down. We'll be happy together for a while here. Then we'll go away. I want you to see the river, the moonlight, you and me. There's so many things I want to say to you, Sandra, but Robert would never let me say them. He hates me, did you know that? He always hated me for my thoughts, because I'm cleverer than he is. He couldn't manage without me, that's why he hated me. He always laughed at me, flaunted his sweethearts. He thought he was going to have you too, didn't he, Sandra? But nobody can take my sweethearts away from me. My beautiful old Sandra, he can't have you now. Barrett! Barrett! Oh, Sir Spectre, the door was locked. It's all right. The window was just as good. Inspector, congratulations. Your timing was perfect. I was on guard against everyone but myself. Open up! Mr. Julian! Good evening, madam. It's all right, Mrs. Miller. Where's Mr. Wilde going? To prison, madam. It seems we arrested the wrong man. 
This is Inspector Temple, Mrs. Miller. How do you do? Uh, but Mr. Fleming confessed. That was our idea. One confession leads to another. At least that's what we gambled on, eh, Sandra? Poor girl. Mr. Wilde did rather commit himself, didn't he? Are you saying that Mr. Fleming's coming home? Yes. That is, if Miss Carpenter can persuade him to. Do you think I can? Of course you can, my dear. Yes, Mr. Fleming. A bottle of Mums, 37. 37, sir. And two glasses. Welcome home, darling. Welcome back. It was a rough trip for both of us. It was a nightmare. But let's not talk about it ever again. Your wine, sir. From now on, it'll be all for love. <laughs> ah, celebration. Douglas Sirk was one of the most patient men in movie history. He waited literally decades to fulfill himself as a director. And even though those prime years were short-lived, he made the most of them. Sirk was born in Hamburg to Danish parents at the turn of the last century, starting his career as an actor in Germany during the 20s under the name Hans Sirk. His last name is actually spelled S-I-E-R-C-K. He finally got offers to direct at Berlin's famed Ufa studio, but that was after it had been taken over by the Nazis. Cirque made nine pictures there, both features and shorts, before deciding that the future was elsewhere. First France, then a peripatetic trek through South Africa, Switzerland, Holland, and finally the United States. He ended up at Warner Brothers in 1939, where he didn't really do much of anything until, in collaboration with other German émigrés, he directed an anti-Nazi picture released by MGM in 1943 called Hitler's Madman, which led to a series of mostly independent productions, like today's offering, and Sleep My Love, another semi-noir from 1948 that was an entertaining riff on Gaslight. He did a terrific job with Sam Fuller's original script, Shockproof, in 1949 although the film was maimed by studio executives who forced a happy ending on what should have been a fatal romance a la gun crazy. That's when Cirque returned to Germany, thinking his Hollywood career was finished. But Universal hailed him back to direct a bunch of studio fodder in the early 50s, films that showed only flashes of Cirque's signature style, which would fully emerge with Magnificent Obsession in 1954, the first of several classic melodramas he'd make with the studio's biggest star, Rock Hudson. Now, it was these bold and unapologetic melodramas, all that heaven allows, written on the wind, the tarnished angels, and imitation of life, that secured the director's place in cinema history. But at the end of 1959, the 62-year-old director confronted a slew of health problems that made him move back to Germany, and Cirque never made another studio film. Now, things didn't go that well for the original producers of Lourdes. James Nasser made only two more films, An Innocent Affair and A Kiss for Corliss, before he ran into money trouble in 1952. Security First National Bank got a California Superior Court to foreclose on Nasser for the $100,000 he'd borrowed to produce Lourdes. The bank ended up getting the movie instead of the money which is one way indie films like Lourdes end up slipping into a netherworld where no one's quite sure who owns the rights. Fortunately, this one was sorted out, eventually. Nasser's erstwhile partner, Henry Kessler, 
ended up working on four films with Humphrey Bogart as a producer at Santana Pictures. As a sly tribute to his colleague, Bogart named a character after him, the other murder suspect in the 1950 classic In a Lonely Place, on which Kessler was the associate producer. But perhaps the most interesting contributor to today's film was scriptwriter Leo Rostin. He had a unique entree to Hollywood. In 1940, the Phi Beta Kappa student from the University of Chicago, fresh off his PhD, was appointed chief of the motion picture section in the Division of Information for the National Defense Commission. He spent two years studying the inner workings of Hollywood under a research grant from the Carnegie Corporation and the Rockefeller Foundation. In short, he acted as a liaison between Hollywood and the Defense Department, helping coordinate cooperation during the war. Rostin's research became a book, Hollywood, the Movie Colony, the Movie Makers, the first unbiased insider's analysis of the movie-making business. It offers an amazingly detailed look at the industry circa 1940. Now, during his research, Dr. Rostin was in regular contact with the PCA office, which might explain why his draft of Lourdes was passed with few exceptions. Although he'd come to Hollywood as an impartial observer, Rostin ended up with some impressive script writing credits, All Through the Night and Captain Newman, M.D., plus a few good noirs, The Dark Corner, Cirque Sleep My Love, The Velvet Touch, and Where Danger Lives. He'd become most well-known, however, for his humorous stories about Hyman Kaplan, a Jewish immigrant with a penchant for malaprops. The success of those stories led to Rostin writing The Joys of Yiddish, an indispensable text which details how words such as chutzpah, kibitz, and shlemiel made their way into everyday American usage. Now, next week on Noir Alley, we feature a film based on a novel by another guy who had a way with words, Raymond Chandler. Make a date with Dick Powell and Claire Trevor and me for our screening of the first film to feature legendary private eye Philip Marlowe, 1944's Murder, My Sweet. Now, while we await Marlowe's arrival, check in on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed and let us know what you thought of Lourdes, Lucy's Waltz into Darkness. Until next time, remember, if you want to be cool, stay in the shadows. <laughs>